by inch and a quarter of Pyrex blank for a telescope mirror. Oh, nice. Oh, for it a sits mirror. here. Pardon? That's a mirror or a... It, it it will be. It's a it it's a okay. it's a Pyrex disc that that I can grind down uh -huh. into a, a telescope mirror for like a Newtonian or a Dobsonian. Sure. Mm -hmm. Eight inch. Here's another one. Wow. I'm tempted to make eight inch diameter binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> so two mirrors. That I can look at the sky in 2D. So it's sort of like a bicycle built for two. It, it's binoculars for two, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so like uh, it, would, it would basically be two telescopes sitting uh -huh. like this. And I think it would be looking over my... No, it'd be looking this way. The mirrors would be back here. And I have two eyepieces. And if I get the get the focal length correct, uh -huh. then I've got stereo vision. That will probably never happen. <laughs> we have some time for that. But oh, everything that we talk about definitely happens. So, hey, let's go ahead and start the homemade camera podcast. Um, we do not have any music um, today. Um, we're without it, Ethan, and Ethan right. is running the uh the obs so we're gonna just kind of run this as a dry episode um with us today is jason lane of pictora graphica and pictora chroma no what is the chroma chroma graphica, chroma graphica. there we go um uh jason uh as many of you know is a lens designer he's been on the classic lenses podcast a couple of times um, and have you been on other podcasts? Anything? Are we, we number three? No. Uh, large format. Large format. Okay. You're, yes. you're number one, buddy. Yeah. There you're we number go. one. There we go. <laughs> with a thumb or with something next to my index finger. That's the, um, so we, we brought him on, um, because of my, uh, a lot of reasons, cause he's very interesting. Um, and also because I have this like renewed fascination um, with uh, DIY lenses and um, some stuff, stuff along that line, uh, those lines. Um, and uh, and we, we and he also does uh, the J Lane dry plates. Um, and we'll talk about all of those. So Jason, Welcome to the podcast. Hey, glad to be here. I was oh. not late. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, so let's um, let's start off. <laughs> Is that beer you're drinking? That's a silver can. There, <laughs> it's it's ten in the oh diet A and W. There we go. Okay. That's uh, that. I, I don't have a cold beer in the house, so. Okay. Oh. It is my day off. There, there we go. Hey, uh, that, that's a good thing. Um, so uh, we want to we we want to start off this chaos um, with a little bit of. Um, you are a lens designer. You're a professional lens designer. Yes. Um, so that must have been a bit of a journey. I know you kind of backed into it sideways, um, so, which would be a crab walk, I guess. You crab walked into- I, I learned as I went. Excellent. And I, and I found that this has been true of a lot of things. So uh -huh. um, the dry plates and all that good stuff. But yeah, so I, I, am, a, I am a professional lens designer. I earn my money. Um, that's not as glamorous as long as I've done it now because half my time is spent in meetings and I, I've got a team of uh, lens designers that work for me. So it's partly hurdy catch, which is, mm -hmm. which is okay. <clears throat> I'm not a manager. I don't care what, no, I'm not a manager. I am a lens designer. I, I've got a big program 
at work that uh, I'm designing some of the optics for. I've got another team of engineers uh, that have designed some of the other optics. We just got through a, a major milestone review. Mm -hmm. So I have a huge backlog of dry plate orders that I need to, some like a thousand plates, which is great. Um, yeah, but, uh, and so now I'm into the, the part, the other part that I like, nobody likes reviews, um, yeah. except customers who like to see the supplier squirm. <laughs> uh, uh, but now I'm talking to optical shops at, and getting getting optics on order so that we can build the build the stuff. So it's it's good. Cool. Yes, it's I, I do I do earn money doing what I love um, aside from the meetings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I I started off um, I started off life uh, getting a bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering. Um, the bachelor's, so I was ready to graduate as a happy double E playing with electrons. Um, my last technical elective in college in undergrad was a um, classic optics course. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was, if it was a professor, the way he taught it or something, but I was like, hey, this is pretty interesting for a couple of reasons. One is I can actually see what I'm doing. You can't see electrons in a circuit. Mm -hmm. That's stupid. Uh, it, it, it deals with light, and it it was it was interesting, and it appealed to me in a way that I decided that I need to stick around in grad school and learn more about this stuff. I'm I'm gonna ask you. Um, at this point, are you a photographer? Are you somebody who takes a lot of pictures, or is that not even? part of the interest at that point in your uh, at, education? At that time, no, man, I was in college. I was chasing women and drinking beer. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, photographers, no, I, photographers never do anything like that. No, so, no, yeah. no it's right. just, it's all about the silver. Um, the, uh, no, it, this was the, this was the nineties. I'm going to date myself. So this was in the nineties, mm -hmm. like everybody else. I was, I had the little, um, the point and shoot cameras, the zoom cameras, uh, mm -hmm. do a 35 millimeter, just taking pictures. I think I had, my folks had given me an Instamatic when I was younger that I took pictures on. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still actually have some of them and they're, they're glorious masterpieces. Um, but, uh, no, the photography, so the photography didn't kick in until after I graduated, I started, started working uh, and I worked out in the desert, um, and had gone to shortly after I moved out there, I'd gone out to death Valley and, and, and crawled around in death Valley for a while that day and was coming back, uh, to where I lived at night. And I stopped in a Valley called Panamint Valley which has nothing in it except for a, um, a, a silver mine on the north side and a gold mine um, and, and actually um, Charles Manson's compound on the south side. There's nothing else in it. And I stopped in the middle of this valley. It was, it was, it was that night, got out of the car, turned the headlights off, and the whole sky was lit up by, by stars and stuff, like enough that you could see the ground and see your shadows just lit by nothing but starlight. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. And so I bought a telescope with all this newfound money. You know, when you first start actually earning money, you don't pay off your bills, you just buy stuff. Absolutely. Um, right, yes. And, uh, and so I bought a telescope and I got into astronomy and quickly after that, um, I bought a, a Olympus OM-1 and started putting it on the back of the telescope and, and started doing astrophotography. And that's how I got into it. Mm -hmm. When, um, you know, I met my wife, we got married, started having kids. Um, when you, when I started having kids or when, when the kids came along, I, I missed having sleep. So I dropped the astro off of that and, and picked up at photography. Now for my day job at the time. So this was like, right as the digital revolution was coming, was, was kicking off. 
And I was like, oh, maybe I should get one of these new digital rebels. And, mm-hmm. and my boss said, hey, Jason, go buy a bunch of these new imaging arrays and characterize them and see if we can use them for what we do. And so I, I did that and characterized imaging arrays for months and got sick of digital before the digital revolution actually came out of being. I didn't want anything to do with that crap at home. And so I stuck shooting film with that little Olympus. So, so you didn't, um, uh, you didn't see that, or uh, the astrophotography interest and the digital ability to see into the ultraviolet, that didn't interest you at all at that point? Well, so at the time, fi- film astrophotography was still the, the way to do it. Uh-huh. Now, there were some digital imagers, uh, cool CCDs coming onto the market, but they were flipping expensive. Uh-huh. And, and so most people did film astrophotography uh, using like um, uh, Provia 400F and um, you know, Ektachrome 200, uh, technical pan film, yeah. hyper tech, tech pan. Oh, I, I miss tech pan so much. Yeah. I have uh, a, um, I have a bulk roll of 35 tech pan. Oh yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> I'm saving it for, I don't know what, but yeah. um, the, um, so, so that's how I was doing it. And, and like I said, I had to drop it because I, I just ran out of time mm-hmm. uh, raising kids and stuff. And then we moved out to New Hampshire um, and, uh, and didn't pick up the astrophotography until recent, recently, which I'm now using a, a Nikon uh, D5300 uh-huh. and um, a, a D810, which I got for really, really cheap because it has like 200,000 shutter firings on it, which is okay. yeah, yeah. awesome that it still works, by the way. Yeah. Um, and so I'm doing the astrophotography again. This time around, after having done my time sitting out in the cold desert, looking through a little reticled eyepiece guiding and freezing my ass off and then developing it to find out that I forgot the trip to shutter that that's sort where of, I've already done my time. So now it's all the automation, which I've got yeah. the telescope set up in the backyard. Uh-huh. I take the, take the cover off of it and I go back, I go inside and I sit my desk with a beer and, and, and run it from inside. So it's, oh, that's, nice. that's the fun part. But in any case, the photography, you know, as the film photography market crashed in about 06, 07 timeframe, everybody started dumping their cameras onto eBay. I picked up a lot of my cameras for way cheaper than even they, you can get them for now and, yeah. and sort of started getting into medium format with a, with a, a Brownie, Kodak Brownie camera. And then a, my grand, I inherited my grandfather's uh, Zeiss folder. Um, and and was doing that when we moved out here and at some point i guess shooting film wasn't you know i'm a glutton for punishment so that wasn't hard enough and so i started picking up doing dry plates about 2015 2016 and i really i was just talking to to dale wilson about this um that i I was actually interested in wet plate but with the kids in the house I, i was worried about the chemicals and so I picked up doing the dry plates and then, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I, I was just looking at um, doing just the uh, tin types, which is just white yeah. plate on metal uh, or as, you know, clothing on metal. Um, I was just looking at that. And but, um, you know, some of those chemicals boil at 80 degrees, you know, or 85 yeah. degrees or whatever it is. You know, and I live in Florida, you know, we have a power <laughs> outage and yeah, exactly. You open your window and it'll start boiling. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I decided, yeah, uh, to maybe, maybe not head in that direction, but um, okay. So you, so you've got, um, you were doing optics and you were doing photography and yes. So how did those two things really influence each other? Because you're doing the optics as a job and you're doing right. it as a, um, you know, for a specific purpose. I'm assuming you're not designing lenses for, you know, 
DSLRs, you know? Um, uh, no, I, yeah. no, I'm not designing for DSLRs, but I am designing uh, imaging les lenses and, and all the different design types that I've done, like um, uh, um, imaging objective lenses, um, eyepieces, um, beam expanders for lasers, uh, and, and uh, geez, I can't even remember, uh, other things, um, not only for the visible spectrum, but also the infrared, which okay. is a whole world that, you know, photographers don't, aren't even aware of. So like consumer photography it is just a small slice of a, of a larger optical design world. But but we'll we'll focus on that. But yeah, so um, re reinforcing them. So I I, I got to kick back to the astronomy thing because that's that's how I sort of melded photography with the optical design was was through that. It's it's kind of probably backwards from, or it's it's weird. But that's okay because I'm an engineer and engineers are weird. Um, the in, in general. Um, the photography as a as a way to to get a, a what I call field experience with optics, like how do they actually work out in the field? There's mm -hmm. there's a big difference between an optical design on the computer or or on paper. If I'm a glutton for punishment, um, there's a there's a there's a big difference, in, and this is what I tell the guys that work for me. There's a big difference between a desk engineer and an engineer that actually goes out in the field and handles hardware and understands all the nuances of real parts. Because in the end, um, we're not designing paper designs, right? Yeah. We're I I'm designing the guys that work that I work with. We're designing real hardware that which is going to go out and be used in environments that would frighten photographers um dust salt fog uh sea spray um cold cold temperatures cold enough that uh you know your eyeballs would freeze or hot enough that you could fry an egg on the hardware that we build um very extreme environments and um and if you haven't handled hardware, much less hardware in those type of conditions, mm -hmm. then there's no way in hell that you can design a system that works. And so the photography, using cameras, using lenses, um, provides an insight, provided, provided an insight early in my career that it, it is, is irreplaceable. It's, it's so key to... To designing optics that actually, you know, designing real parts that actually have to be made. And it's not, and I talked about this in the Classic Lens podcast, um, it's the design itself, the prescription, um, it's just a small part of optical design. Get into that optical prescription, like what you go and look up in a patent. Mm -hmm. That's that's a small part of it. It takes maybe two weeks of creativity to bang that out, and then six to nine months of all the other stuff to make sure that you can produce it and that it will work in the environments. Um, and that's like tolerancing, putting it in mechanical barrels, figuring out what the stray light's going to do so you can control flare. Uh, what is it going to do over temperature? Is your are your doublets going to delaminate? which a lot of the old ones did because they didn't do this analysis. Um, if you drop it in water, what's gonna to happen to it when you take it back out and wipe it off? Is, is the surface gonna get scratched? Are the coatings gonna peel off after five years of storage in a 140 degree warehouse? All that stuff. Um, so when you know some people in conversations will say, Oh, you're just a lens designer. You don't really know about optics. And I go, I know way more than you would imagine. But so, I go, okay. 
yeah so so yeah so that's that's part of the um um one of the things you know i teach graphic design and web design and one of the things that i tell my students all the time is that when you're you know the point of creativity is the design you know when you're doing the very first sketches everything else is revision and yes. um all of those bits of revision are are super important right yeah. um and you, you know and and then uh, you know as you were talking there i i was realizing that you know that i keep calling you an optical designer but you're a lens designer yes. because uh the optics are the glass and how they how they bend mm -hmm. but the lens is the whole is the unit am i am i correct in that well um, it's it's uh <clears throat> the the yeah ki kind of uh, so yeah when when we're designing a, a lens yeah and it, it's semantics i don't have a good term for what this is because a lens is also this little piece of glass but it's also this whole thing right yeah and okay. so and, when, um, and and for those who are listening he was holding up a lens shutter combination um yeah yeah and it looks like it's vintage that shutter looks like it's, it's a it's a heliar 210 four okay. five okay and um <laughs> so so yeah, Random. there there is that thing that we call a lens that is the glass, and there's that thing that we call a lens that includes the shutter and the aperture, so and the shutter release and the timing mechanisms and all that. Right, stuff. and so this this sort of gets into one of the neat things. Um, it's it's sort of a mix of that, and and the reason I say that is because I definitely don't live in a box. I don't design optics with with blinders on, because you know, I'll, I'll work for those two weeks to create a prescription, um, re review it with my peers. And, and a prescription, what you're saying is that is the idea of this will bend the light in this way, that'll bend the light. Yeah, way, it's, and this will bend the, the light. Yeah, it's the radius of curvature on the surface of the glass, it's the thickness of the, the glass, it's the type of glass, and it's the orientation relative to, uh, you know, all, all the lenses and how they're laid out, how they are, um, their positions relative to each other in space that you then wrap a barrel around. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's a prescription reminds me of, of a prescription for medicine that a doctor would write out on a piece of paper. And that's, that's kind of a good analogy because mm -hmm. A, it exists, well, it used to just exist on paper. It, it exists on the computer. Mm -hmm. And it tells a shop what they need to make, an optical shop, what they need to make. It gives the optical shop the information that they need to make a, a real piece of glass. Yeah, so it's the critical outline, but it doesn't necessarily say what the gelatin capsule, the pills going to be made of or any of the, the other details. Yeah, so that's right, that's, right Nick. That's the, that's the rest of the design. And, and, and like I said, I, I don't, I don't design a, 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 a piece of hardware by myself because on, on our design team, it's me as the, as the optics guy. Maybe that's the term, the optics guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I work very closely with a mechanical engineer who knows the intricate details of the mechanical parts, the material properties, all that good stuff. Um, if there's, there's electronics involved, so there's an electrical engineer uh, there's there's a software engineer, and then there's the the systems engineer who are kind of coordinating things, um, and then the management, which we all gripe about. Um, mm -hmm. Any present management company accepted, um, but but it's not like um, it's not like I don't know anything about the mechanical parts. Uh, I do because because what is the what is the best material for the barrel you know well it depends on how how well i have to control the relative positions over temperature because things move over temperature they float around when you assemble them they they don't all assemble from from unit to unit they all don't go together quite the same way because of tolerances mm -hmm. 
Um, and it, and the teams that I work on, especially this one I'm working on now for this this program, is a really good team in that all all the all the leads like myself, my my Emmy counterpart, um, and the SIS guys, they all have experience, uh, a lot of experience, and they have a lot of insight and perspective, and we understand what's important for the all all the different. Um, disciplines we call it integrated product team which is kind of a which is kind of a um, uh, one of those terms that's overused but it, it it really is does sort of describe what's going on so when we when we talk about a, a lens design when I share the prescription what the optics look like I export a solid model that the MEs can pull into SolidWorks um, and 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 design the barrel around, and and I don't throw it over a wall. I'm working with the guys. I'm talking to them on a daily basis, saying, "Okay, yeah, this is how the lens needs to be mounted. Um, uh, here's here's all the tolerances. I, I spit out that info, so it has the lenses have to be controlled in centration, plus or minus a thousandth of an inch, or something like that." And the, you know, it can't tilt too much. And the air gaps between the lenses have to be within a certain amount. How are we going to mount that so that we can assemble them quickly? Or do we need to do active centering and all that good stuff? Um, so there's a lot of interaction in between the different disciplines and there's a lot of overspill. So, so, one, so an, as an example, perhaps it might be true that if the mechanics of a lens were to be challenged to the right to their limit, then you might need to make your optics a little more forgiving in order to take that into account. Yes, like that. yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a common problem is is that give and take. It's it's there's a fair amount of negotiation, but it's not like. You know, the, the fate of the world's not at stake, but it's it, it down in the engineering team, there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, usually one of the first things I do is, is say, hey, I need these features added to the inside of the barrel to control stray light, like, uh, like helical cuts. And it's, you know, plan on it being blackened except for where the, the glue that's used to bond the optics in are going are gonna to attach. Oh, uh, we're overweight on our, on our assembly. Okay, well, maybe we can grind the lens down on this edge and have some fletching to reduce weight. Let me go back to the prescription and see if I can decrease the weight. There's a lot of that iteration and stuff that goes on. Um, well, I interact a lot with mechanical engineers because they're, they're hardware. Um, the software guys I interact with when we start talking about, you know, the stuff I designed for isn't used for film, it's used for digital imagers. And so then you have an imaging pipeline um, that you have to worry about the post-image processing real time to display to a user. And so I work with the software folks to make sure the image processing is, is, is good. And then also one of my responsibilities is to make sure that the, the whole system level imaging performance you know, uh, uh, meets the customer requirements. So can we see these, these things out at distance that we're supposed to see and, and modeling all that stuff is, is very intricate. And, and uh, my job security is no, not very many people know how to do that correctly. Um, so I try to make myself useful. So, I, But anyways, um, so all that stuff plays on a, on a daily basis. And as as things progress, then it's it, it's it's fun to have a design realized because it gets sometimes on a daily basis, but definitely on a weekly or a monthly basis. The the product that started out as a vision in your head is becoming more and more real, it, and it's um, so that photographers can relate. It's it's like having a vision for a for an for a, a final product in your head when you go out to a site to set up and compose and, and make sure that you've got the right film and, 
and the right camera and lens and all that good stuff because you want you've got this vision in your head of what the final photograph um, what you want that to look like and then as you I go through the process of taking the picture and making it then it becomes more and more real it's yeah, i think it's, it might be more analogous to an entire book or a, or a gallery show or something with more part moving parts in it than a single photograph and i think it's very valuable to make that kind of planning part yes. of your work yeah i build yeah, things plan that take a, a long time to build and i find that the planning is really one of the most satisfying parts but then making it and then finding all the little things you hadn't quite got right or you know need to yeah. be fixed until you finally got something that works it's, right it's very satisfying yes the planning part for me i can get impatient a little bit uh but uh but the planning part is definitely important especially on complex systems i try to stay below that level i know they want they want me to get higher up, but I want to stay more technical. So my planning is more on, okay, I've got a, I've got a budget, I've got a, a number of hours and a schedule. What do I need to do? Who am I going to tap to to do the the optical design work on 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 projects that need more than one guy? Um, how is that going to play out? That used to be daunting for me, but as I've done more and more programs that that part's gotten easier because it you know when you take one picture even though the end result is 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 different and sometimes there's different things you know it all it all ends up started starting to be be similar and so that it's nice to get that over the course of my career it's been nice to get that experience uh, above and beyond doing the actual optical design and and the challenges to that but it, it's fun i enjoy it um it means i don't get a lot of sleep because it's a lot of long hours especially when when we're buttoned up against the schedule but um when you're on a good team and and everybody believes in the product and um it's for a good cause i guess and and nobody's doing anything really stupid um then it's a lot of fun. Cool. <laughs> and, it, and it pays the bills. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to take a little bit of, uh, of a detour. Um, so you, you know, there, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the term busman's holiday, the, the idea you drive a bus as a professional and then your vacation is driving around. Uh, so... <laughs> Um, do you, so I'm going to ask you the busman's holiday question. You spend all your time designing lenses. Um, do you design lenses for yourself, for, for your, your own photography? And, um, is that, it's something that is, you know, is, is part of, you know, uh, of loving what you do? Uh, in a sense, I think, I think all the lenses I design are kind of for myself. So like there, there's one design on this program and, I, and I'll get to your question. I should have wore my, I go off on a tangent shirt. It, I've got a shirt that says sometimes I go off on a tangent. I think that that's the subtext of our show. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, one of the, one of the designs I have fun with my optical design, even at work. the The answer is 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 yes, but I don't often realize them because the costs of prototype optics are extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to try to fix that through my side business uh, because if you have an optical engineer and my business partner is a mechanical engineer, you get those together, lenses are going to spit out, but not but not yet. Mm -hmm. um, at work, I have fun with it because, uh, like one of the one of the uh, imaging lenses that I had to design uh, based on the requirements and all that good stuff, I was flip, flipping through my database of, of starting point designs. And I was like, I haven't used a sonar lens design yet. I want to use that. Okay. And so I started with Bertelli's 1932 design and, and uh, 
use that as a starting point, you know, tweak the focal length and, and, and got the imaging resolution and stuff that I need. And, and so now one of the cutting edge uh, optics that are gonna be fueled out there is, is Bertelli's. It doesn't look anything like that. If you saw the layout, you'd be like, sure. That kind of looks like it. And that gets to uh, what I was, what I probably was telling you about design families and how they're related by correcting aberrations. It's still a sonar lens. Uh, the sonar lens is cool and it, I think it's people who use it are really really like it. I like it because uh, compared to the other lens that's used often say the double gauss, the sonar doesn't get on, on paper doesn't quite get the same performance. But in a production setting, uh, where you have to deal with tolerance, and this gets into the the prescription in a little a small part of it. Uh, when you look at a tolerance design, an actual production run, the the performance is more consistent for a sonar, which means that it's it can you can get better, more consistent performance from from unit to unit um, with looser tolerances than a double gauss. Uh, which which I thought was interesting when I figured that out. And it, it was very critical for this design because it was a very high resolution imager. And I started by looking at a double gauss, but the tolerances were such that it, while the performance looked good in ZMAX on, on paper, it wasn't a realizable design because you couldn't couldn't put it together and hold the tolerances. Okay. And that's and that's an important and that's an important point. That that and the consistency from unit to unit. Uh, one of the things I'll tell people is when you see reviews of a single lens, um, it only really tells you about what that actual lens is doing because you do get differences in performance from lens to lens in a production run. So, uh, uh, you know, this, this two, 210 Heliar, if I test this, it, it may end up being a piece. Of, it's not. It's going to be. It's a hellier, but it might be a piece of crap performance wise. It only says, it only tells you about this one. The next one on the production run uh, or on the production line might be a screamer just because of the tolerances, fabrication tolerances, and all that good stuff. So you get variations around a, a nominal performance. Okay. And, and you're saying that in as a uh, sharpness, um, detail, color rendering? What, whatever, or... your, whatever your performance me metric is. Okay. Uh, in, in optics, one of them, one of them is, is like the MTF curve. We use that quite a bit. Which is? Uh, uh, the modulation transfer function. So if you go and look up MTF plots, um, it, uh, it tells you how, what, let me see. I always struggle with this definition because it, I, I try to avoid nerding out on it. Um, it tells you based on the size of the details in your scene, how good your contrast is gonna be. Okay. So, so um, and for smaller and smaller details, uh, you know, the limit is, is uh, the diffraction limit. So uh, you've obviously heard about the diffraction limit and, and as you stop down a, a lens, the, you know, you're, you're at some point, the, the image starts getting blurrier because diffraction is kind of taken over. Mm -hmm. Well, it, absolutely. from my perspective, how I interpret that in my head is that the MTF curve is, is dropping down as you stop down. So it's a, it's a physical limit. Um, we won't get into that here because that would consume a whole textbook and it does. Um, but it, it, it's a performance me metric for like resolution and stuff. Of course, resolution is also dependent on your imager, mm -hmm. um, the imaging media. But I, I guess getting back to my point is that on a production run, you're going to have screamers and you're going to have lemons. And when you pick up a lens and you've heard good things about it, it doesn't perform quite like what you'd expect. Maybe you got a lemon or, or maybe you have really critical standards. I, I don't know, but uh, um, that's so sort I just, of- Can I break, break in and ask a question? Is my sure. thing on yet. 
Um, yes. So with that increased tolerance you're talking about that a sonar has for, um, let's say, um, variation on the production line, does that also yes. mean it, it could maybe take more hard knocks without going hopelessly out of whack in the field? Well, potentially. Uh, <laughs> sort of, you know, everything else being equal. Uh, the design itself, taking hard knocks and still working usually isn't a function of the design itself. Because if you knock any lens hard enough, you're gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna screw it up, and then you know it gets sent back sent back for repair and stuff. But um, that that's more a function of how the lenses are mounted in. Mm -hmm. So if you if I do have a high high G shock requirement to meet. I'll be looking at uh, not holding them in with retainers where the lens can shift under the retainer, which would blow out your mm -hmm. performance, but uh, bonding in with like RTV or something like that. So, right. so those sort of requirements, this is where the requirements that we get are, are important. We got to understand them all and make sure we address them all. So it, because it informs design decisions like that, the performance you know, so you're, it's, you're, it's, so you're really more talking about um, if there's some sample variation between individual elements. Yeah, uh, it can stand up better to that. That kind. Yeah, of thing. yeah. Um, you know, you, when I generate a lens drawing, um, say say I have a lens that has a, a on the front surface a radius a curvature of 100 millimeters, which means that if you if you looked at the profile of the of the surface, it's it's an arc of a circle with a radius of 100 millimeters, radius curvature. If I told a shop that that I wanted that, they go, okay, well, what are the tolerances? That's the first question they would ask. Mm -hmm. So I learned real early to make sure I understood that. And that's in in my design software, we can do tolerance analysis and stuff. And what, um, so I might say 100 millimeters plus or minus, uh, 0.3% or something like that. So 0.3%, it can, when the, when the shop fabricates it, it could be anywhere from 99.7 uh, millimeters to 100.3 millimeter radius of curvature. Mm -hmm. That's and, pretty big difference. It, yeah. Yeah. And that makes uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's a difference in, the way I specify those tolerances, it's not by guessing, it's, it's by doing an analysis and saying, okay, all the tolerances in my prescription, including, including that, the thicknesses, variations in the index of refraction, um, air gaps, all that good stuff. I've got a, 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 an analysis that we do where it, it basically, um, you specify all your tolerances for all the, uh, all, all the aspects um, kind of add up all the worst case it, contingencies and see how bad it is. Not not the worst case because that would make it very pessimistic. What it does is it <laughs> randomly assigns tolerances, randomly assigns values within the tolerance band for each of those, and basically generates a a system, compares it, collects some information on the whatever metrics you set, and does that for. 100, 200, 300, 500 different systems that it cranks out. And this can take days because it's so processor intensive. And what it does is it, it generates statistical information on, on, the, uh, on how, how that performance metric varies you know, within, within those 500 systems. Right. And, and it looks like a, a distribution. So most of them will fall within some nominal performance, you'll have some outliers. Mm -hmm. And then I go back and I tweak the tolerance, the tolerance specification to pull in those outliers into what I need. And it's usually so that it's usually the way I do it is um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with loose tolerances and I'll start tightening them up until the worst performer is above my min minimum performance requirement. So that when they produce 500 lenses, um, then I'm guaranteed that they'll all, you know, meet some minimum performance. So I, I bought, and this is, um, boy, uh, this is 
four years ago. I bought a Schneider, uh, I, I think it was a 65 F8. Yeah. But it wasn't Schneider branded, it was Linhoff branded. So, well, I mean, it was Schneider and Lin, uh, Linhoff added their, their name to that. It's so made at uh, Schneider's factory. Yeah, well, but here's, here, it, so I did some, some research on that and yeah. what apparently Linhoff was doing was they would go to the factory and say, okay, we'll test all of your lenses and we'll pass some of them and yeah. we'll put a Linhoff name on them and we'll sell them on whatever Linhoff device it was sold on, yeah. whatever camera it was sold on. So what you're saying is they went and cherry picked yes. the, the screamers. And so I really got something, even though I thought it was just, I thought it was total BS at the time. And, <laughs> you know, to my eye, it probably is. This, these kind of tolerances may be not even within what I can see um, for a technical, um, technical, operation yeah it, it'll meet their standards it'll meet it a, yeah yeah it'll be able to see something or or not see something it'll be able to register and right. i and, and i can see that but but for me as a dilettante photographer um as a crappy photographer um <laughs> i i will probably i you know i probably you know i would be happy with with something you know with the cheaper version but yeah. but but that does explain to me what what the hell was going on there. Yeah, um, and that's and, actually and that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and that's actually something that we deal with on our project too, because sometimes the requirements are so tough, and the optical designs are, are so complex. We're, we're actually dealing that with this on one of the other designs where, um, as uh, remember that that system level modeling that I mentioned. That's that's sort of what's generating the optical design requirements. And as we learn more about what the system is gonna be able to do, just based on uh, ongoing analysis and design work, you know, in that system level model, it's sort of a living document. I can see the performance numbers starting to track down and down and down. And it gets to the point where some of the, some of the optics that we're gonna to put together in a production setting aren't going to meet the spec. And then we have to start talking about production yield. And, and the crappy thing about that is that the per unit cost, the final cost of the customer for each system mm -hmm. starts going up because um, you have to toss out. Yeah. Right. So if they're if you're if the production yield ends up being 50%, then each of the ones that's pay, passed on to the customer basically costs double the amount. Right, because sure. it's got to pay for the. Because there's no such thing as a free lunch. So. Yeah. Um, so did they sell all the old ones to Fred at? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. At so. <laughs> what What usually happens in in reality, because the optics, in particular, uh, are so expensive, you don't want to just throw them away. Um, right. They cost way more than you could want would want to know. Uh, what we do is we put them back into rework. Or, or the production folks. I, I work on the engineering side. They put them back into rework and they try to realign it. There, there's a complex alignment procedure. And if in, in the end, you're not meeting the metric, you gotta go try other things. So they'll, they'll put it back into rework, maybe swap out a lens or something or try to fit them together. Oh, okay. I know in, in the telescope community, uh, companies like Mead will do this where they they put it up in front of uh, something where they can look at the wavefront coming off, and they'll they'll actually tweak the rotate the corrector until they meet the spec or whatever. So that's that's oh. like rework type stuff. It's like a Leica, uh, the old Leicas that were everything was adjustable, and they just had yeah. to sit back into spec right. if there and, was yeah. and the everything adjustable. You can actually run into the problems with that where you have too much adjustment. And you don't know where you start. So, so part of that design process is, is the, and we're getting into this now, we've been getting into this for, for a couple months on, on our designs is, all right, how are you going to build this thing? 
How are you going to assemble it? You get all your optics in, you get the barrels in. How are you going to put it together to meet the specs? Mm -hmm. And so part of the job as a designer is, is to say, okay, we're going to assemble this sub barrel and, and the lenses will be aligned actively. The sub barrel will be put into the housing. The next one is put in and then we've got to align those relative to each other looking at stuff and it's it's a complex but it, that's that's how we do it so that's that's nick's deal um you know he talks about how to birth the baby um you know you you gotta <laughs> you gotta figure that in um yes. you know i mean it's yeah it's similar to you know if you're molding something you can't mold a complex thing that won't come out of the mold. <laughs> right. No. So, so yeah. the yeah. So the thing that Leica does with their adjustment, uh -huh. that's that's how it's done for for complex systems. So, so like stuff that that I'm working on, stuff that goes out into space, especially they they tweak that to the nat's ass. Um, so Leica's, it's like yeah, I. I I understand what they're doing with their optics. Uh -huh. from, from my perspective now, um, I, honestly, I don't like doing that. I'd rather be able to assemble them quickly, slap them together, and be a really good performer. That's that's a successful okay. lens for me because it's um, it, it's just easier. It's sure it costs less, uh, which as a taxpayer I appreciate. Um, and and, uh, and yeah, uh, for me, a successful lens is one you can put together and put together easily and still be a really good performer. And, and that's, and I've done that. I, I know how to do it and, and sometimes can, sometimes can't. I have been, uh, as part of my uh, homemade lens creation, uh, I've been taking apart um, cheap zooms. Um, yes. You know, the quant arrays, the, you know, the, the, those types of zooms. So, I mean, uh, I, I'm seeing the other end of it, right? I'm seeing that end. Um, yeah. You know, there, some of them disassemble quite easily. Um, yes. Some of them have structural tape. Um, for those of you who have not, not, put, not ever taken the lens apart, but underneath that, uh, that grip at the end of the barrel, there's structural tape that holds that thing together. Whatever works. Whatever works, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I'm uh, following following along. Now, Yeah. this is, yeah, we, uh, now let's, I'm going to ask from a photography standpoint, um, and Nick has something, I guess, uh, as well, but um, yeah. from a photography standpoint, how much are these variations going to be visible to my eye? I mean, and we're not, let's say on um, a 16 by 20 print, yeah. um, you know, uh, I know that the classic lenses guys talk about, yeah, I got that one, but it was a dog. And then I got another one and it was, you know, perfect on it, though, you know, I mean, they often say that within relation to Soviet lenses. But um, are yes. I mean, is that what you're you're working in that these are or are the tolerances that you're talking about way past my ability to see 300 dots per inch on a uh, no well it, it it really depends on uh, the the imaging resolution so the the size of the 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 pixels so like um, annoyingly sometimes they think that a, a, a FPA that's designed for cell phone cameras you know low resolution cell phone cameras they think they can get high resolution out of it those are the how shall I say it the most interesting ones to design for where your where your uh, sampling frequency for the folks who understand this is like 400 cycles per millimeter. Um, imagine a sonar lens for that. I got that to work. But um, um, so it, it, what that said, but, like but on the other, but on the other hand, the pixels can be huge. And so it, it really depends on the, the play between the focal length and, mm -hmm. and the resolution. But, but getting to your question about what you can see on a print, um, I, I don't know about quantifying it, but I, I can tell you that 
from a from a lens to lens variation, you usually won't see it on axis. And I'm talking about wide open. You stop it down, everything looks the same. Uh, but wide open, usually you won't see it on axis um, where it, it'll be sharp. It's it's at the corners, and it's little differences in in that um, the swirliness of the bokeh. Where, where it, you'll still have that bokeh, but it'll look a little different from lens to lens. If there's something going on where it's blurry or on axis, I don't know, I'll check to see if there's any haze on it. Um, but uh, uh, usually on axis aberrations, if you see variations, it's, I don't see that so much. It's more the off axis stuff where I see variations or the, or the variation in the field of view, slight field of view, because you're when you assemble a lens, if there's if there's variations in the the air gaps, the distances between the lens, mm -hmm. the 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 end result is you have a slightly different focal width, which gives you a slightly different field of view. So you, if you if you do, and that's hard to from a photography perspective, that's hard to see because you rarely have two pictures taken with two different on, on the same camera with two different lenses that are framing the exact same thing okay you know it, it's more of a you'd have to test it in the lab and i i don't encourage people to go out and test in the lab go test out in the field because that's where you use it yeah yep um but i i, I don't know it's hard to it's hard to quantify um okay so so maybe another way to talk about it um well actually before i forget there was one thing i wanted to uh, ask about um and maybe you don't know the answer but i just um uh gave a took apart this lens that i found for eight bucks in a thrift shop and yes. it's a really interesting lens it was made by mamiya for argus and slr it's a 58 millimeter 1.7 lens yes. with a really nice 10 blade aperture and it's really well made um but it was the helical was frozen so i took apart cleaned it and relubed it and I noticed when I was taking it apart that there is a there's a big metal cylinder which into which the front optical block is screwed, and that yeah. cyl cylinder turns independently on a very fine thread and has a set screw. And it looked to me like a way to custom adjust the distance between the front and rear element, yep. um, in, independent of the helical. And you know, I noticed this, and I'm pretty sure I got it back on the little mark where the set <laughs> screw was. <laughs> counted the right number of turns and we'll see but uh it it'd be it, it really interesting it, yeah it struck me that that's it was pretty dramatic like it gave a lot of adjustment range um, yeah i i would guess without knowing what the the lens is but i would guess that that adjusts the spherical aberration mm -hmm. you know so that that um uh the the soft look that we talk right. about with classic right. lenses and so they probably had it um if it was if it was put together so before the 80s yeah it's it a probably six element yeah 1960s it's a six element lens and i'm going to make a, a guess that it might be similar to uh a biotar but i don't know for sure but just because yeah. of who was copying who in that era and the fact well, it's that it's probably a 58 a, millimeter um, yeah it, i would guess it's probably a double gauss type design uh-huh uh, maybe at which oh, I know it's for that, an SLR, uh, right? It's for an SLR, right? 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 Yeah, and I know that the front, the the separation distance between like the front group, the group in front of the the aperture on a double gauss, mm -hmm. right? As you as you adjust that distance, you're correcting um, spherical aberration, uh, coma, mm -hmm. and astigmatism to a little bit. So I would imagine that that the technician who put that together probably had um, an eyepiece so they could look through it with a crosshair so they could see at some target and then had an adjustment tool to adjust that until it looked good to their eye. Yeah, and luck luckily the set screw had a pointy end and left a pretty clear mark in the threads. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always <laughs> looking for those marks when I take the lens apart. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So then the, the place I wanted to go next is um, I, I recently bought a camera with a much bigger and higher resolution sensor than I'm used to using digital. 
Um, and yeah. I've been shooting a lot of film lately, and then I just took this detour. And, but it gave me a reason to compare a whole bunch of lenses on the same imaging device. And yeah, that's cool. one, of them, one of them just stood out by a mile, and it surprised me. Um, and then I found out later that other people have the same opinion of this lens, but it's a, um, a Nikkor P lens, 75 millimeter, 2.8, made for the Bronica S system. And yeah. the Bronica had this interesting retracting mirror that allowed them to make a lens that protruded much farther in than is normal for an SLR. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I just couldn't believe this very old 1960s uh, five element lens is just knocking everything else I have sideways. It's so freaking good. And I'm wondering how much of that is just the quality of the production because they were trying so hard back then. And how much is this sort of exceptional design because of the special mirror? There's just so many reasons why maybe it's a little bit, you know, better. But I, what's really driving so, me crazy is right, that so I, it seems like it was made for this sensor. Like the way it transmits color, it's yeah. perfect. The way it, the, the, it's just, I can't find any fault anywhere in this thing. <laughs> so I got so I've got to gush a little bit on 1960s Nikon. I got a little bit of a bromance going on with their <laughs> lens designers. I can't remember what their names are. I'm sure some of your listeners will. Right. But they they were nailing those designs in the 60s. Uh, and I think it was in part because, um, you know, they had just come out with the Nikon F in 1960, right? And so they right. wanted to put their best face forward because they were taken from a, from a corporate perspective I can understand that they were taking a big risk with their SLR and, and this whole system of, of new lenses. That was a new thing because you think about what they were competing against the Germans um, with their um, non, non SLR, basically non, non removable right. lenses. And so they yeah. want to make a good, good impression. So they went all out on their optical designs. And by that, I mean, and this is this is going to be a subtle but key key thing is they weren't taking any risks with those optical designs. So if you look at what they right. put out with the Nikon F, it was like a fifty f two was there mm -hmm. their lens, and they had I think the one point eight. I'm not sure if that came along later, but definitely a fifty f two, which is just a great f number and focal length for designing for an SLR. Right. Um, and and stuff like that. So in the 60s, not only were they they putting out these great designs for the Nikon F because mm -hmm. they had to and they went all out. I'm, I'm sure they were eating money on the R&D budget on that before they started making money selling the Nikon F. Um, but anybody who came along like Veronica said, hey, design a lens for me they probably went all out as well because they were building a reputation and, mm -hmm. and to the Japanese credit um, in that time frame, you, you know, I'm sure you remember made in Japan was kind of poo pooed. They were building a reputation and making sure that they did all the right things that they had to do to, to become. Well, actually you know, I do remember. I, anyways, I bought, I bought my first Nikon in uh, 1974. Yeah. <laughs> And it, I used it nothing else for the next 25 years. It had yeah. that 50 F2 lens on it. So, you know, I saw that happen. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and, um, and, and, and it wasn't just Nikon. It's, it's Nikon. I gush on Nikon because I'm a Nikon guy and I've, I shot most of those, but, but Canon as well. Any of those companies coming out of Japan, they really got their shit together for sure because mm -hmm. they, they were hell bent on, on taking that market from, from from the Germans and they did successfully, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, and and, a, and so it it just from a lens design perspective, I think for Nikon in nineteen in the nineteen sixties, it just came together, and then from there they just built built from that. It, it they they did and really they, well actually a lot them. of those lens designs lasted for decades. I mean, they're yeah, even still they're still making some of those early. Yeah, designs. the fifty the fifty one point eight besides coating and glass sites, it's still yeah. the same prescription. Yeah. Well, anyway, this big sensor has kind of dumped me back into Nikon territory and I'd, and shooting film, I had kind of gotten all excited by some of the other flavors and yeah. especially, you know, small film. Um, but this, this thing is, is the big 
the high resolution sensor is quite strict. Um, but the one thing, and this is what I really wanted to ask you about, the one thing that I have still am just not happy about, digitally speaking, is color. And I mess around in Photoshop and in Lightroom and all that stuff, you know, more than I want to. But I still feel like the lens is the most important part of that equation, at least in yeah. my experience, that if, if I use the wrong lens, I fight to get good color. And if I use the right one, it just comes popping right out. And I'm really curious about, I know coatings have something to do with it, but I can't believe it's the biggest thing because a lot of lenses have good coatings. Right. I, I think there's, I think there's probably just as I'm thinking about it, there's probably like three main things. One is, is the filter on the sensor itself. When you're talking digital, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a UV IR cut filter that's put right. on there that limits the wavelengths because yeah. the silicon is it kind of like film is, is um, sensitive to a broader mm -hmm. spectrum, especially up in right. the infrared. So if you cut the, if you pulled that cut filter out, you'd get this magenta wash in there because the, the, the blue channels and the red channels up above deep red, like 650 or 700 nanometers, right. they both see that, that near infrared. And that's why you get the magenta. magenta Actually, the, these, these Fuji sensors have fairly weak filters and they do pick up that magenta. So yes. if, a, if a lens is strong in magenta, it really comes through on the Fuji, definitely. Right, so that's, so that's part of it, I think, which is different. And, 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 the, and, and the key point in that is that you've got a different color response than you have for film. Right. Um, some lenses, depending on the glass types, some lenses will transmit um, the ultraviolet spectrum, the deep blue, right. uh, uh, violet, ultraviolet, better than others. And that's, that's a function of the glass type in there. So the lanthanide glasses that, um, that Ernst lights, um, that lights started using in the 1950s to make the Summicron, which was revolutionary, that, that lanthanide crown um, blocks the, the, if you look at the, um, the spectral transmission, it rolls off in the very deep blue into the UV. The classic glass types pass that ultraviolet and, and, and there's historical reasons for that because back in, in the dry plate era, huh, um, you know, ultraviolet was, was an important part of, of getting your effective speed up, you know, getting all that right. UV. So the glass types, had to, I mean, they did pass ultraviolet. And as time progressed, I think what happened historically is they knew how to make more useful glass types from a lens designer's perspective, but they couldn't necessarily use them until the 1950s because film in that time frame still needed that ultraviolet to pass through. Mm -hmm. And in the 50s, as they sort of solved the problem of blocking the ultraviolet so you get a more consistent um uh film this, speed this is all the reason why it will it will give you one speed for indoor light and one speed for outdoor light for a lot of yes film. and that and that used to be a wider variation so like for with my dry plates i tell people that they need to open it up like three or four stops if they go indoors because you lose that ultraviolet of of uh, that you get with sunlight um, but in any case, so you've got glass type, different glass types in your, in your different lenses that pass more of that lower blue or, or block more of that lower, lower blue roll off. And so you get a shift towards a warmer spectrum, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, like you, like you said, Nick, the, the coatings as well. So the example that I always tell people is if you look at the old Olympus Wico type lenses yep. and the pictures taken from them, they always have sort of a, a warmer, mm -hmm. warmer colors look more vibrant. I like if it. You shoot with a, uh, I love it. I love my old mm -hmm. one. I love that lens. Um, and they did that purposely. And the way you do that is you specify the coatings just a little bit differently mm -hmm. to get the, to shift the, the peak of the transmission up towards the warmer colors. So you've got that going on as well. 
Um, and then Fuji makes a film oh, I, blue sensitive. <laughs> I have a I have a question. I have a question for you um, uh, yes. as well related to this. It strikes me that I on my digital cameras I'm actually enjoying colors from some older lenses very often. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that has to do with the lower contrast in that I'm noticing that very high contrast lenses seems like, um, I feel like there's less subtlety in the color and, and the king of subtle color is this Veronica. It's just amazing how delicate the color shifts look. And then I shoot with a different lens right next to it in the same spot. And it's really different uh, in that respect. Yeah, part of that, part of that is just sort of the pure dumb luck because obviously a guy who is designing a lens in the 50s didn't realize that digital oh yeah i know sure yeah, i mean if yeah. they did that means they were from the future they could have made a killing on the stock well, market but uh well i'm just trying to figure out what the dumb luck involved and i'm wondering if lower contrast can be seen as an advantage i, for I think so lower lower contrast to me means uh uh lower lower MTF at the higher spatial frequencies. So you don't get, I, I don't know what the hell this is. I, I think I know, but the micro contrast that you hear, which is a pure photography, mm -hmm. we don't use that in the lens design world. I'm sorry, guys. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's those higher spatial frequencies that you resolve really well. I think, I think causes I looked at this before. I don't remember the details, but it interacts with the size of the pixels that cause some sort of aliasing that I think either messes with the image pro. I don't want to say messes with the image processing, but the image processing that's done where it combines the colors, you know, the it RGB gets, colors. The data it gets is less effective, perhaps. It's would be a it way to interacts say it. with the algorithms a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, than a lens that that has lower contrast at those higher spatial frequencies and and uh, and um, just just ends up looking looking different or or better or whatever. I think is mm -hmm. probably where that play is. Right. So it's just you know my natural tendency to just experiment is is probably the best way not to try and anticipate too much. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I, I'm I don't really think struck can... by how nice this thing is and how well it works with this particular particular sensor it seems like they're made for each other yeah yeah and, and it's hard to predict ahead of time if you go okay this lens from this company is going to act like that because it's there, there's mm -hmm. nothing in the in, in the data and the information out there there's no correlation it's just pure dumb luck of the design except that i guess uh i guess there's a loose correlation with lower resolution maybe it sounds like um so like a kodak ektar lens which is the classic portrait lens for a large format uh not the not the really fast but the commercial ektar right. has it has a soft look to it wide open looks mm -hmm. gorgeous on an eight by ten probably would look pretty good for um a, a smaller format if you could figure out how to hack it together so I got to say, a lot of the older lenses are really working with this camera. So another example is a, yeah. Zeiss Kodak, a Zeiss Kodak and a Stigmat that must be at least 100 years old. It's a tiny, tiny little lens. Yes. Um, and it is coded, but it's it's a 114 millimeter thing that would have gone on something like a, um, you know, a Graflex RB Junior or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it's fantastic. Just really, really nice not you know not quite as sharp as the newer lenses in the, but everything else about it is wonderful you know color yeah i uh detail personally right personally i i like a lens that's a little bit soft wide open and when you stop it down it sharpens up so i get that mm -hmm. flexibility mm -hmm. i found that that makes really nice pictures um so like the older nikon lenses i put them on it when i when I want to remind myself why I don't shoot it, I put it on a digital camera and it's like, oh, it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. Let me go run it. Let me go put it on my FM3A and go take some pictures. Yeah. That's, that's usually how my thought process goes. But um, yeah, I that's kind of what I like. Um, yeah, I do have to stop things down a lot with the, the jumbo sensor and longer focal lengths. It took me a right. little while to adjust coming from the APS-C camera where it didn't almost didn't matter what you set it at. This thing, you really need to not be afraid of F16, F22, and, and even higher. Yeah. <laughs> you know? 
with yeah. the big old lenses that have you know giant apertures. Um, so that's another interesting feature is that you, you know being able to use medium format lenses at an, at a reasonable focal length, you have these huge apertures that don't cause diffraction, and I think yeah. that's a factor too. Um, hey, anyway. uh, can I spin us a different direction yes. to your other facet, the um, the J Lane dry plates, and um, uh, and and that um, uh, the idea of uh, creating uh, emulsions and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, uh, how did that come about? Well, so I, I kind of touched on it earlier before we started getting off on tangents. Um, that, uh, you know, I'd always shot film, right? And, and I guess I wasn't, actually I was, I started reading about uh, wet plate shooting tentites and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that might be interesting as, because uh, I like the process. As an engineer, I like the technical challenge of getting it to work and, and doing all these steps and having something presentable actually kicking out the back end. Um, but with the kids being the age they were, I was worried about the chemicals that you need for doing collodion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, 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 I came across the um, talk about dry plates on APUG mm -hmm. and, and which pointed to Denise Ross's website, The Light Farm where she talks about making emulsion and there are some recipes there. I found, it wasn't one of her recipes, but I found a recipe for emulsion and was reading through and I was like, hey, if I bought these chemicals, I think I have all I need. Um, it's thelifefarm.com, one word. Uh, I, I was like, I think I have all the stuff I need to control the temperature and, um, and, and, and step to it. I've got my engineering background, so the technical side doesn't scare me. So, hey, why, why, don't I, why don't I make some emulsion and see if I can get it to work? And so I made the emulsion uh, a little amount and uh, coated some plates and shot them and developed them. And they look like shit. And I was like, why do they look like shit? I have no idea what's going on. I've got to fix this. That's what an okay. engineer thinks. Tell me, tell me what, in what way did they look like shit? Were they uneven? Were they? Well, it was, um, it was my test victim, number one, my oldest daughter. Uh, it was underexposed. Like you could barely see her face. The emulsion started lifting up off the glass as I developed it. So it's got those weird wrinkles around it um and and it's um but it was and she was moving around a little bit um but it was enough for me to go well, well this is kind of cool and it's and it, it was a it was a very tangible thing when you hold a dry plate when you develop it it's a solid piece of glass that has weight to it and i tell people it's like it's like holding a film negative it's it's like that tangible, but but more so, because it's it's heavier and and if you drop it, it'll break. Um, so you got to be careful and all that good stuff. And and that sort of and, and not getting it perfectly right, underexposed, all that good stuff. It was the first large format photograph that I had made. Actually, I bought a piece of crap thing from the 1890s for 20 bucks on eBay that was falling apart, but it, the bells were tight and the shutter worked. And so that was part of the char challenge too. So I coded some more and it, it gradually, slowly improved and, and, and then I was hooked. So, and then, then um, so I did that for a while, like a year, year or two, making the plates, um, took some pictures of the, of the antique fire trucks for the local fire, did stuff like that. Um, had some boxes over Christmas vacation in 2017 that with work getting busy, I didn't think I was going to have time to shoot. So I threw those up for sale on, on APUG and they sold in those three boxes of four by five sold in like 15 minutes. And I, my inbox was full with people asking if they, if I had more of those, if I could make them in different sizes and, and sort of, so it took off from there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so uh, to make the dry plates, it's all about making the emulsion, 
uh-huh. and then coating them and all that good stuff. So, so y- you have two different speeds. You have your yes. standard ISO two outdoor. I think that that's right. And then a, yeah. and then a twenty five. What's the difference um, with those? Do they have different sensitivities and I mean yeah. spectrum sensitivities? Yeah. So so historically, the difference is that the 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 ASA two plates sort of represent the beginning of the dry plate era, the early 1880s. The, the ortho 25 represents, uh, I don't wanna say towards the end of the dry plate era, but, but the, the late 1800s, the, the 20th century, when, when dry plates, when film had, had come out and been out for a few years and the popularity was sort of going up and dry plates was going down, uh, analogous to the transition between uh, analog to digital, right? So if you think film was kind of like how digital was. Um, so it sort of brackets this creative period where there was a lot of amateur photographer activity where uh, photographers were making their own emulsion coated plates, figuring out how to improve it and sharing the results in periodic journals. And then, and then having people like George Eastman starting to do it and commercializing it and, and selling it and, and creating this, the first amateur photography, you know, the first amateurs in photography got their start shooting dry plates because it was convenient enough that you didn't have to bring your own dark room. And then the advances that, that uh, like the Eastman lab, the, uh, when he got uh, Mies in, and started making real progress on advancing the technology. It sort of brackets that time frame and represents the, the beginning and and, and, a, and a level of maturity in the dry plates. So the the ASA two plates are I call them normal sensitivity. I think uh, where it sees UV and blue a lot like what wet plate. So it, so it looks a lot like wet plates. There's differences, but it looks a lot like wet plate and, and it has the same spectral response. And then the 25 speed, they're orthochromatic. Um, they actually use the first orthochromatic, the synthesizing dye, uh, erythrocin, which is FDNC red number three, I think, food coloring dye. Uh, you know, that it represents that advancement. And um, so, you know, it sees into uh, green and yellow and, and even into the orange a little bit. And it has a faster speed. So, so 25 speed outdoors in the middle of spring. If you meet her, if you meet her onto the gray card at 25 and, and, and use that reading, then you'll get a good exposure. That, that sort, of, sort of thing. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so you're making these things. Um, uh, do, do you have other any other plans? Where's your 100 I? Where's your 3200? Um, what's <laughs> and and here's and I'm gonna going to ask another thing. Um, any interest in making 120 um, uh, uh, on uh, an acetate? So uh, for for the plans. Yeah. Um, Every good engineer has a roadmap, and I have a roadmap. So, okay, um, and, and, and share what you feel comfortable if you if it's. Oh yeah, of course. Um, I uh, I won't share my plans about trying to take over Antarctica and building a a secret base where I can. No, uh, I won't <laughs> talk about those those evil scientist plans. Yeah. Um, Right now, I so I've got four high schoolers working for me, four, four kids working for me, coat and plates, prepping glass, all that good stuff. It's all done in my basement. Every good, successful business started in somebody's basement or garage. It's getting crowded there. So one of the things I'm doing right now is trying to find a commercial space that I can move into and, ex, and expand, have, have room to spread out. So like when the when plates are being coated, um, you know, with the lighting stuff in the basement, the 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 girls who build the holders they can't make 
plate holders because they have to have the lights on, but the coating has to have the lights off. So there's that juggling that's always going on. You know, I'm hoping to spread out so I can, I can do both at once in a, in a facility. Part of that is, is uh, if I do that uh, to help pay for the rent, um, I probably will open up a little retail front and sell like film and chemicals and crap like that to the, to the local folks who shoot film. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't want to get consumed by that because that's not in my business plan. The, the space will allow me and my ME partner to start looking at putting, a, putting together a, a film coding line and coding film, probably large format to start out with because that's sure. the easiest to handle um and then just see see how that's going to play out and you go well that's loony you can't do that you have to have a facility like Kodak no I don't I don't think you do and and part of it is is realizing that the thing I want to do is I want to bring back obsolete emulsions old old emulsions like what was done at the turn of the century. And if you go and read what they are doing at the turn of the century, it was very primitive compared to what's done today. You know, there's a hundred years worth of technology advancement that happened. And, and I also know there was a video that I saw, I think, I think the late Ron Mowry had posted a video where, where I, uh, a former Kodak employee down in Australia basically built a film coding line in his garage. I'm I sure think, you've seen that. I think I'm actually, uh, I'm going to share a screen because I had, um, uh, I had seen something along these lines. And I think that this is what you're talking about. Yes. Is this machine. Yes. That is like my, inspiration this is why i think i could do this yeah uh, and it's, beautiful. I think it's, it's um the website is sao paulo camera style.wordpress.com and um this is a post from 2012 yeah and um and it looks to me it looks like he was doing 120 so and we'll put that in the show notes um, yeah, I, I, I thought long and hard about what format I would start with. I think large format is probably the easiest, ironically, because 120 film, how the hell do I make backing paper that's not modeled like the, the big guys are having problems with, Right. you know, uh, I'm going to avoid all that. And then the 35 millimeter, there's all that additional stuff making those little holes in the side of the film that's i i'm telling you so hard to do if you I have, have a, my budget <laughs> i have a thousand hey. feet of clear leader that is perforated that i'll donate huh. to the process all you have to do is i'll give you the thousand feet you just have to give me a hundred foot roll <laughs> you hear how so, good yeah, that so deal that, was for me so 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 <laughs> Really, the only the issue isn't the format; it's whether it's single sheet versus roll. There's no yeah. reason not to shoot single sheets on medium format as well. I mean, yeah. all my most of my medium format cameras already are set up to take two and a quarter by three and a quarter holder. Yeah, so it, yeah, you like uh, the you've got the Mamiya uh, plate adapter backs, film plate adapter backs. So people do yeah. buy them; they're the six plate formats. That uh, I think Roly um, did. Roly had a back like that too. Yeah, and place. Lynn Hoff and um, yeah, I actually sell quite a bit of those enough that the six plate format, so that medium format, I buy stock glass, pre pre cut glass for it, and the little boxes. Mm -hmm. It's so awesome. I was so excited when I got those boxes in. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, people got buy them quite uh, uh, surprisingly. Well, let's be real. Not many people buy them in the grand scheme of things, but enough for me to go, whoa, I need to get boxes and stuff just to, so it'll be in a cool little box itself that it fits in. Right. Anyways. But you're also talking about making the thin film, right? The, uh, not just glass plates, but um, acetate mm -hmm. or whatever. Right, 
Right. Yeah. And so, no. so you mean many two and a quarter by whatever cameras can use single sheet as well. And yeah, no reason not to. I'm also, the other thing though, about doing large format is that that's where the fewest choices still exist. There's still yeah. quite a bit of choice in 120 and, and 35, but we're getting down to not enough choices in in the big formats where it almost matters more, you know, right? That to have some choice, yeah, yeah. And and some people might be wondering, well, why why can't you start doing that now, coding, cutting them up and coding by hand? And the answer is, I could do that, but the that film market is such a larger market than for dry plates right that i would quickly be swamped i i don't get enough sleep as it is so it basically and and part of it is just forcing myself to go through the process of standing up this this production line and, and figuring all that out from an engineering perspective i mean the the information is out there i don't have to I don't think I have to have modern equipment because obviously they're making film 120 years ago. So if they could do it, I sure as hell should be able to do it. What I don't have is probably is their budget. And and so, their film would burst into flames. So yeah, we're gonna try to avoid that because <laughs> because I, I uh liability. Liability fire is bad. Fire is bad. Um so yeah, so I kind of have to do it on the fly and on the cheap. And, and like I said, that guy's website, what he did down there in his garage is sort of my inspiration. Now, yeah. he, I think if you look at the details, he was, like you said, making 120. I think his sheets were probably four inches wide or five inches wide. Um, I would do- Here, hang on a second. I've, uh, uh, we can bring it back up. Um, and that sheet, and let me see if I can zoom in. Is it, oh, yep, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, that looks to me like it's, is it 120? Maybe it is. Maybe it's uh, a couple of 120s. Yeah, um, it's probably wider than what he could actually use because you do yeah. get issues at the edge that you have to trim off. So he probably trimmed it down to 120. And it so, does look like the yellow portion in the center is not the full width of the acetate right yeah it, that that's a test run so you can see he machined that coating head out of clear acrylic so you, you can see inside of it and so he's doing a test run with yellow dyed uh gelatin solution oh, okay. just to see how well it it coat and you can see that there's non-uniformities at the edge and all that good stuff yeah it's okay. um but yeah so we've been talking talking about that uh me and my business partner um yeah it's 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 pretty I, cool I have, I have another comment about roll film backing paper is essential for uh some cameras but mm -hmm. um the more modern film holders with a mechanical advance system you could simply load them in the dark you don't need backing yeah. paper. <laughs> or or the other thing Seriously, the way you take care of the issue is you roll a 220 roll. Yeah. Same, um, same thing. Right. Yeah. The, anyway, sorry. I'm... No, 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 that's good. I've, I've thought about all these things too. I, I think, I think if I can, if we're, if we actually pull off doing the large format, mm -hmm. it'll, let's be honest, it'll be a flipping miracle. Um, this this isn't something that that that's been done, you know, starting from a garage and building a film company like this in in a long long time. So I, I must be insane. Well, but other if that's successful, <laughs> if that <laughs> if that's successful, then I mean it'll generate cash flow. And yeah, and it, I I hate to say it, but it always a lot of times it always comes down to money, mm -hmm. you know, because if I do the other formats and the stuff that's involved in doing it, especially like the 35 millimeter just imagine having to design the tooling to cut those sprockets because uh, the keep up with demand you know i still have to do the big sheets the but then i have to slice it down yeah hook the holes in them not by hand uh and then and then can it right 
And yeah. so all that stuff requires equipment that has to be uh, built. Um, and I'm not in, independently wealthy any more than you guys are. So it's, it's, it's all built on, on funds. So that, so yeah. doing the large format would get the cash flow rolling in to support that. So it's, it's sort of a kind of, cause I, partly because I want to mm -hmm. have the company pay for itself. And also because no sane investor in the world would invest in 120 year old technology. Yeah, but you do, but we've got we don't have to worry about sane people because we have <laughs> no there is an inexhaustible people. supply of crazy people. Yeah, right. Yes. So Kickstarter's <laughs> all about the, you know. Um, so what you want? It's so Graham, that's perfect. You want a crazy person to to be your partner. That's, that's what Kickstarter is. It's filled. I with need a. <laughs> I, hey, so so we need to get like Elon Musk in the shooting dry plates, guys. Yes, I need your help with that. Absolutely. Uh, not to although, say that he's a although, crazy person. Let me don't. I'm not going to. I think that you might have a problem with the THC um, that, that connects with the dry plate. Okay, never mind. Oh yeah, they're competitors. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> so so I mean, also. Um, uh, well, while we're still rattling around, I'm going to say uh, eight by 10 would be maybe my first choice since you'll also have fewer customers, but they're used to paying a lot more for each sheet. Um, well, I and... do want to make it, I do want to make it as cheap as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mm -hmm. in the initial planning, I'm, I'm thinking uh, probably a, a 12 inch wide roll is probably a good starter because mm -hmm. like I mentioned, there's going to be uh, emulsion issues at the edges and hopefully that gives me enough um, margin on the sides that I can chop that down either to 10 inches wide for the 8 by 10 or, or at eight, 8 inches wide or whatever and still, you know, still cut some through people, smaller sizes. Some people will pay extra for the funky edges I think but whatever. Um, <laughs> so I'll let, you, I'll let you know Nick I am going to ask um, the I, so I, I'm I'm kind of um, uh, hedging this question because it's kind of like um, uh, I'm trying to think of um, asking a vascular surgeon um, what is the best way to chop an onion. Okay. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to ask is, uh, and this has to do with, um, uh, you know, I'm, I've been throwing together these lens elements, uh, yeah. and seeing what sticks, you know? Um, so I'm going to ask for a little bit of assistance. Um, and I'm, uh, going to share a screen. So those of you this is on, of course, on our YouTube. Um, for those of you at home, I'll try to describe those of you at home. Those of you listening, uh, I'm going to describe as best I can. So what I have up here uh, on my screen is actually a, a Google search. And it's a Google search. And um, uh, we, um, when Jason was talking about a sonar lens, I looked what the formula for a sonar was, and I look up at the, and that's a planar. So <laughs> there's the sonar. Yeah, but what, yeah. what came up was this, and this is, um, uh, it is a little thing of the development of the double Gauss. Um, and it's a Gauss objective, which is a positive meniscus and a negative meniscus. And then there's the double Gauss, which is you put one of those at the front and you put, uh, you know, a Gauss pair at the front and a Gauss pair at the back. And I tried to build it based on, I tried to build one based on this. And yeah. I used the formula that I have. Um, and this is my, I, I've talked about it in a bunch of different episodes. Um, but this is the thing that I got from Eric Maffey, that formula. I put it in a spreadsheet. Um, Eric's awesome, by the way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Total shout out uh, for Eric. And um, 
uh, he and I and uh, Dom Silverthorne uh, are going to be putting together a, uh, a project uh, that may be a, a, a podcast coming, coming soon for, for us onion choppers um, as opposed to you, the vascular surgeon. So, so the question is, so we, you know, this is, this has worked fairly well for a two element lens. Right. Um, oh, wait, hang on a sec. Yeah. Okay. So the formula one is a two element lens. You put, you know, the focal length at the front, the focal length at the back, the lens separation. Um, I don't know why I had it at zero. Uh, and then you get the back focal length and you right. get the focal length and the back focal length. So I can build something like um, this <clears throat> and I'll show it uh, to the rest of the people. Um, these are two elements out of a uh, quanta ray zoom, uh, or it may have been a Rocor zoom. I don't know what exactly the, the zoom was. I, uh, I've forgotten at this point where I have a front element and a back element. I figure out about what their focal lengths are and I create a lens from that. So I thought that all I needed to do, and I'm going to flip back to this, was figure out what the focal length of a positive, you know, of a Gauss lens, which is yeah. a positive meniscus and a negative meniscus. I figure that, and then I come back to my formula and I put that in the front, whatever my result is in the front. And then I put that same thing in the back and then I get my, my formula. So for instance, and I'm gonna use, like I had a 320 uh, positive, yeah, I had a 320 positive meniscus and a 130 negative meniscus. So right. here, let me put that in, 320, uh, 320 and a negative, what was that negative number? Come on, where was it? Negative. Uh, oh, wait, ne hang on a second. Negative, negative 200? 130. No, 130. Yeah, negative 130 here. Let me put that in. Right. And I separate them by here. It'd be much more realistic, it, realistic of a five. Okay. So what I end up with is a focal length of negative 224. Yeah. Okay, so if which I put, means that it's a it's going to be a negative lens. Yeah. So, but if I put a negative, if I take that negative two twenty four, and a negative two twenty four, I end up with a negative lens again. So, yes. um, which makes sense. Okay. I'm, go ahead, I'm, go I'm ahead. doing something. I'm doing something. I think I've so, so stop it's chopping weird. the onions. <laughs> yeah. So if you want a positive, so yeah. So when you get the negative focal length, it means that yeah. the um, the rays at at your image plane are just diverging. It's not going to come to focus. Right. And, and in in optical terms, we call that a. a an imaginary image plane because you if you ray trace it out yeah. the rays at at the back end are diverging so if you drew dashed lines forwards you'd see that the focal length is toward the front but it's imaginary because you can't actually put a film plane there and, yeah and get an image because your film would be blocking the light coming in from the lens so we call it imaginary if okay. you want to get a positive focal length, which you need to form a, a focus. Right. Right. Okay. Your, so, oh, your, your positive lens number has to be smaller than your negative lens number. So if you put in positive 100 for the front lens, just as an example. Okay. And you, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put in what it was. Um, so, oops. And no, sorry, that's the width, 69. And then my negative, I had some other stuff going on. Uh, uh, 
or somebody else was playing around with numbers on that because that's a public sheet. And my right. negative meniscus is one minus 158. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so now you're, yeah, you're back, back focal length. Uh, here's the other thing is um, this is another key point is in optics, um, when we look at a lens layout, and this at, at work, when I see the opposite of this, it annoys me way more than it should. Uh -huh. But when we look at an optical layout, the light is always coming in from the left and, and going out on the right. So the okay. focus is always to the right. And, and there's a key reason for that. And it's tied up into these numbers. So a back focal length, when you see a positive number, uh, it's, it's in reference to the, to the optical axis and the optical axis has one direction and it's to the right and a positive number means that um it's positive to the right or towards the back of the lens so when you see okay. a back focal length that's a positive number it means you're going to get a focus behind the lens if it's negative it's 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 the opposite direction and and you'll have an imaginary uh -huh. so that's that's one key thing these the sign convention we talk about the sign convention becomes important in optics to keep everything straight. Okay. Um, okay. So, so positive to the right. That, yeah. I'll, I'll say at work, I'll say positive to the right, which implies that your lens has to be facing the left in, in, mm -hmm. on a, in, in a drawing on a piece of paper or on the screen or whatever. And if you look in, and if you look in Google and you look at uh, lens layouts that show the rays, uh huh. It, it always looks like that unless some non-optical engineer laid that out and put it backwards and every optical engineer looks at that picture goes oh it's backwards yeah and it bugs yeah, them yeah. way more than it's like fingernails running out of chalkboard for a lens designer if sure. the lens is facing to the to the right not to the to the left yeah. Yeah. anyways so you re you realize you've revealed your kryptonite and i know how to <laughs> take you out now <laughs> now we're gonna we're gonna uh, yeah people. You know, with, with bad it, lens, I, I can guarantee you, I'm going to forget about this conversation. And I share that. And uh -huh. in like three or four months, one of you is going to throw up a picture where the lens layout is, is mirrored and facing to the right and the uh -huh. rays are focused to the left. You're going to ask me a question and I'm going to say something about it. I'm going to be like, can you flip that drawing around? I guarantee you. And I won't remember <laughs> saying this at all. Yeah. And you'll be like, that guy's an idiot. <laughs> doesn't matter <laughs> so all it all i need is a mirror to, to mess with you. <laughs> so here's here's my question so i have a focal length right now of 115.9 yeah. so 116 i'm gonna round it because you know because you can because i can't right exactly exactly i mean i'm gonna be focusing with my eye so if i take <laughs> <laughs> um, so that is now I'm going to go back to my, if that's a gaw, a gauss. Yeah. Okay. So that's a gauss, gauss setup. So if I go back to that, can I just take this 116? Oh, come on. And get rid of that negative 116, uh, separate them by. 10 20 or 10 whatever am i gonna end up with a double gauss that is a 63 millimeter with a 52 millimeter back? yeah so so if and this gets into does that formula into, work does that logic work that i yes, do them as and, units and the cool thing is uh that that paper i sent you which i don't think we've talked about so yeah we're we just haven't. gonna let people guess yeah <laughs> what the hell we're talking about the mysterious paper it has to do with what? ice and the south pole yeah it, <laughs> it's uh it's um uh, it's secrets if you share with anybody i have to kill you um oh, the I'm no moving. uh when you read in that part where i'm talking about um uh, you know you start with the landscape lens and um At, uh, at uh, with an F number that's uh, 
half of what you need. So like if you wanted to design an F2, you'd set the aperture for F2.8 with a single landscape lens. And then you add that lens that's like a astigmat mm -hmm. uh, on the other side. So you, you saw that diagram in, in, the, in the design of double gauss description and, and a, a similar thing for the Cook triplet, designing half the lens. And because it's, that's how, that's not historically how it evolved, well, kinda, but you design that half the lens, just like you're doing here, and get the aberrations on, under control for that. And then you double it and you mirror it around the stop and you've, right. you've halved your focal length, you've kept the safe, same F number. So instead of F2.8, you've got an F2 that's well corrected because it's, the aberrations are corrected in both, both sides. And, and in addition, the symmetry, the, uh, go back to that Google page and let me yeah. see if I can see an example where you show the, the double Gauss evolution. You can see, well, I'll, I'll talk about design symmetry and the double Gauss, and this is really where it's, it's leveraged heavily, is the lenses look the same in front of the stop and behind the stop, and there's a reason for that. Um, the reason is that that symmetry, some of the, the what we call the odd aberrations, um, distortion, lateral color, coma have have a negative sign to the to the values in front of the aperture and a positive sign to the values behind the aperture so if the if the amount of distortion in the front part of that lens is the is the same magnitude but the opposite side is the distortion in the back of the lens and they're going to cancel out and you natively at, almost as a freebie correct your first order distortion or correct your distortion and your coma and your lateral color. And that's the real yeah. beauty of the ga double Gauss design is that that, that, des that symmetry around there corrects some of your aberrations without you huh. having to really do anything as a lens designer to directly address them. And so then in other the, words, something goes astray a certain amount and gets corrected back the same amount in the other direction, essentially. E exactly, and, right. and that's true for the third order. And that's true for, um, now I have to add the caveat. So that's true if you're, if the object that you're imaging is at the same distance as your, as your image plane, right? Now, uh. in, for, for photography, so that uh, on, your, on your site, the, the yeah. picture uh, that shows the rays, the blue and the, and the green and the red rays going through, yeah, that one there. That obviously doesn't look what most people would think is symmetrical, but I do as a lens designer, that's still a symmetrical design. There's differences in the front and back because you no longer have the same distance between your, your object and your image. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's set for focus at right. infinite. So you sort of have to compensate for that because the numbers don't quite tweak out the same. But still, you're so taking advantage so, of that symmetry to cancel out like distortion and coma and lateral color. So, it, so essentially, the, the first idea would be a one-to-one -one macro, um, where yes. the film is the same distance as the subject. Right. And, th and then you, what you're doing here is you're sort of aiming that you, effect you're, out at a greater distance. Right. You're tweaking it a little bit because you know that you're, you're, you're looking at things that are a lot farther away than your film right. plane. And if you look at classical designs, like the Dagor lens is a, per is a perfect example where the lenses are actually the same front and behind the stop. They did that because they were easy to manufacture, but you do get a little bit of softness compared to the modern lens because you're not quite correcting those aberrations um, uh, exactly at at wide apertures. So the Dagar lens, you stop it down, it sharpens right up because stopping down the lens is, is uh, you know, helps correct, correct a bunch of the aberrations. But if you're trying for a, a fast, wide open lens, um, this is how you do it. You, you have to, you know, a, a, if you wanted to have a fast Dagor, um, 
you would tweak what the 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 lenses in front compared to the lenses in back are. You know, you, they're they're not physically symmetric, but optically, there's this is a symmetric design. If if that makes sense. No, it does. The um, the sonar lens, which you have a a diagram top center, um, kind of does that, but but goes at correcting the aberrations in a different way because it's not as symmetric as a double gauss. So you do have mm -hmm. to address coma, which you, which you address by moving the distances uh, 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 of the lenses relative to the aperture. It also has to correct the stigmatism, which it, which it does, uh, you know, it's got that really thick triplet um, behind the aperture, that that thickness is what helps correct astigmatism, and then then the trip you've got triplets in there because you you can't use design symmetry to correct lateral color, which is you know uh, colors coming to the different um, uh, heights on the on the film plane, you know off axis. So you have to right. make them achromatic. Um, correct color in the elements themselves, um, which you also do in the double gauss, um, but, for, but for the other correct, uh, color chromatic uh, serochromatism. Um, so you don't quite have as much design symmetry. You do leverage that, and then, but then you're balancing the other aberrations. So that it's, it's two, two different, but, but kind of similar ways to approach the same problem. The um, the cook triplet is the simplest type of design that that takes advantage of that symmetry, and it's got just enough variables um, from an optical design perspective to correct all the basic third order aberrations, plus the first order aberration, which is focus. What the cook doesn't do, so you go, oh, well, it corrects all the aberrations. It, Mathematically, it drives them all to zero, but you go, okay, so why isn't it, it like super sharp? Because you have higher order aberrations, which are, or more, more subtle deviations from ideal, which um, the, uh, which the double gauss gives you more freedom. The double gauss, for example, gives you more freedom to balance the basic aberrations against what's going on at the higher order. Um, so those classic anyways. triplets that you see in lots of really old, you know, folding cameras and so forth, yeah. some of them are really quite good. And are they similar to that? I mean, is that similar to the cook? Yeah. They're so the cook is, is just three pieces of the glass. The classic triplets like the, um, like the Tessar, uh, they, they improved on the cook. I don't know if you call it historically, but from a design perspective, it, it improves on the Cook triplet by uh, which which you're showing now. I didn't realize uh, there was a three element tessar. I thought they were four. Well, they're 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 four, but w two of those are in a. What I learned when I got into photography are in a single group because right. it's it's a doublet, right? Got it. So the doublet is is a is a pairing of, of two different glass types mm -hmm. to help correct the color a little bit better than the cook. Right. Um, so, so they're decreasing the divergence in, in, uh, in uh, come, the way diffraction is affected by lines. wavelength. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and from, a, from a design perspective, basically it's adding more variables for you to play with. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more variables that you have to correct the aberrations, the better. And, and in fact, um, really complex systems. This is going to sound obvious, but but uh, I, I I've got a Captain Obvious hat. The more you want to correct uh, your your image quality, the more lenses you add. That's why a double Gauss has has what. Uh, the basic design has six elements in four groups right and the and the 50s all usually have seven or eight you know when mm -hmm. when the f number gets down to 1.8 or 
Um, the most complex optics that I've seen are the ones that a company called Zygo designs and builds for, uh, so for photolithography. So um, creating the, the circuits that are in integrated, uh, the circuit patterns that are in integrated uh, chips, like Intel chips and stuff, they can have 20 or 30 or more optics in them precisely aligned, um, corrected in the ultraviolet um, in these huge assemblies um, to get that correction down because the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the pattern size on modern um, you know, processor, processing circuits are like in the, you can go on Intel and see how, they'll talk about like three nanometers or, or mm -hmm. 13 nanometer or whatever. Well, it's talking about, think about that in terms of the wavelength of light. And to correct that is, is just incredible. And, and those systems that they put together, this big thing that um, uh, ones I've seen are like four foot long and maybe a foot or so diameter. So they're not that big, but they're, they're, they're huge. Those things can be like a million or $2 more per, per lens. Mm -hmm. just because they're so complex and, and precise. Yeah. Uh, but they get it, the correcting to that by adding more elements. And, and what they're doing from a design perspective is just adding more variables to beat down those aberrations. Mm -hmm. So, okay. no, I'm, and so it sounds like a lot of color correction is happening in the back lens. Um, yeah. And that, and that makes sense because it's like the relationship, it's like, it comes through spread out. Now we got to try and get it back together. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about steering the, the light where you want to. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's harder than that, that's that, that, well, I guess when it comes down to it, that's pretty hard to do. Yeah. I'm wondering about playing a little bit with filters now. Um, it's something I've stayed away from, but I've been just assuming, ah, digital filters, but it isn't the same, really. It sounds like you could, you could give a lens less, like if it has certain troubles, you could reduce its troubles by filtering out certain lights. And, you know, yeah, and worth playing with. Yes, you can filter out certain wavelengths to, to improve the color correction, but um, you do have to know where, um, which wavelengths it was corrected for, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so like an achromat is a two element lens uh, which had, which uses two different glass types um, to correct, uh, uh, you know, red and blue. So you need to know what those wavelengths are. So if you, if you actually put a filter in front of a, a lens like that, that let only green through, then you would actually get a blurrier image because, because green, you know, halfway between red and blue is, is less corrected. That's just right. an achromat. So like on a double gauss and stuff. Um, it may, it may be corrected, um, absolutely at like, uh, I don't know, three, three or four wavelengths. It kind of depends on, on what they did with the design. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think we need to start wrapping up cause I think we could go forever. <laughs> I really do think we could go forever, but yeah, we're just warming um, up here. I just want to show um, a double gauss that I have built during the show. Let me see if I can get, there we go. I can get focus on it. Um, and that's tape, by the way. Nice. Uh, so this is a gauss, sorry, let's figure it out. It's got a positive meniscus of 69 millimeters, a negative meniscus of um, 158. And, and I just dropped my <laughs> lens off, but if I put them, if I put them together, there I am. Yeah. So I'm holding these in my hand. So here's my double gauss little handheld double gauss lens. This does appeal to the redneck in me. Get and to the, the yeah. tape or to the you do need duct tape in me. Um, yeah. 
Uh, so here, let me put my other lens back on. There we go. So this is it. Um, yeah. And just using that little formula that I, and apparently while dicking around with that formula, I cleared out the formula. <laughs> so, so I've just got to go back and put it back in. Um, but that is, and this is, yeah. And if you guys notice, I didn't put my lens back in straight. So this so, yeah, is very artistic. Graham. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Well, it's, it's my well, tilt. He's, tilt. Graham is using a homemade tilt. lens yeah. to, to shoot the video it's, that you're watching. That's now. awesome. It's, it's <laughs> semi-homemade and I'll switch to my other, oh, I'll switch to my other camera and I'll show you guys what this is. Um, it'll take me just a second. Come on, FaceTime built in. There we go. Okay. And I have to throw, I have to say one thing before we go, uh -huh. because I just remembered it. But I saw, I heard a, a blip on a BBC <laughs> Science show recently okay. about somebody who is supposedly now making successfully a, basically a like a castable optical glass that they can basically cast in a mold. Oh. Not yeah. uh, you can print it's, it. Um, well, uh, this is this is supposed to be better than that. Okay. Um, yeah. So so here's here's the lens, and what it is is it's just a ring, and then on this side, there we go. It is a shaft with felt around it, so it gets a friction, and it allows for tilting just like a lens baby and nice. the lens element uh the lens that's in there is uh from a rope uh from a minolta point and shoot so that is my uh crack or because kraken is the name i put everything on there so that's my crack or um so that was awesome. that's what you guys have been seeing me on all day but my my camera's like a hundred degrees so i think i'm gonna quit using that for right now but this is again that is my double gauss um horror I, i'm gonna guess with the curvature of that i'm gonna have barrel distortion um quite a bit so yeah the in the the focal length like, like your spreadsheet will calculate the focal length. Mm -hmm. um, as you start wanting to correct those aberrations, you'll you want to dig into you. You have to start taking into account the radius of curvatures and the thickness and the glass types and stuff, which you can actually do. I think I told you this in the message. You can actually do that in a spreadsheet if you were a glutton for punishment. Um, I cheat by using Zmax. Yeah. But uh, but um, that that paper that I sent you at, at a high level um, sort of steps, walks you through the steps that you need to do to design the Gauss, where you start with the landscape lens, uh -huh. and then you have a stop, and then you have that thicker element on the other side of the stop which is corrected for astigmatism. And you can look and you can dig up the, the math. There's a great website that talks about how to calculate the aberrations uh -huh. based on the thicknesses and race curvature and index. And that's really all you need to figure out what that looks like. And once you have that, you've got the start of a, a double gauss. The next step is to make that thick lens achromatic, to, so correct color within itself. And then double it, and there you go. That's the design. It's, cool. It's it's pretty simple, but there's a lot behind that, the math part, which I'm going to tell you. Even for me, it took me years to wrap my head around it uh -huh. to the point where it was intuitive, and I wasn't just pushing buttons in Zmax. But it's if you really want to learn that stuff, it's having a a real problem. And this kind of steps back to what you were talking about. Um, how photography uh, ties into the design or, or helps design. I, I like what you do, Graham, and what Eric does, because you're trying to solve real problems. And 
um, what is it? Uh, uh, what's that saying about the mother of all inventions is necessity. I, I forget the yeah yeah necessity is the mother of all inventions. So if you're trying to solve a real problem, then then you're going to be motivated subconsciously. And this is just how the human brain works uh -huh. to try to figure out how to solve that problem. And, and so if you're just trying to read the math for entertainment, it's going to put you to sleep. But if you're, yeah. if you're reading this stuff to solve that problem, how do I design a double gauss by hand yeah. in a spreadsheet? Then you're going to find that you're going to dig into it and, and figure yeah. out how to do that. One of, one once, of the things it's, though, oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, once you're done, once yeah. you've done that, you're going to look back and go, holy crap, I did that. And that's, yeah, for an engineer, that's a great feeling. But uh, it, we, anyways, one of, one of the one of the problems that, you know, Eric and I are running into and other people is that we don't have the ability to um, to actually generate the lens that we want to generate. Yeah. Um, and so we're, you know, I mean, we, we talk about Fred at, um, surplus shack, um, yes. surplus shed, sorry. Um, and it, so we're limited to what he's got for us. Right. Um, yeah. so, so the, you, there it's, um, I, you know, looking at, uh, you know, we're, we're building a Ferrari with off the shelf Ford parts. Uh, and what we're, and what we're ending up with is a sub Ford, but we're trying you're, to build a Ferrari. You're making no. a jalopy. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You build it with uh, stone knives and bear skins. If I can borrow Mr. Spock's quote from a Star Trek episode. Uh, or, or yeah, I've, I mean, I have a cleaver to chop my onions with, whereas you have the vascular, you know, <laughs> those. So, uh, yes, that, that, is, that is unfortunately a problem because there's a reason, reason for that because optics to make a, make a lens yeah. is incredibly labor intensive. And so sure. if you get a shop to make a lens, you're paying for all that labor and it's not a little bit, it's not a trivial amount. So yeah. a single prototype, can cost you thousands of dollars easily. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get the price of lenses down until you're making a bunch of them all at the same time and spreading all that labor around over 50 or 100 optics that you, that you block up on a polishing block and polish out all at once. And that's, and that's, that's what sucks. And I, I, I feel your frustration. One of the things I tried to do, I've done this, twice i tried to tackle the same problem twice early in my career when i thought i knew everything but didn't know anything um and then then a couple of years ago where i tried to design a cook triplet the problem was can i design a cook triplet with uh, with catalog lenses lenses that i can yeah. buy from like door labs or edmund optics yeah. and there's a thread on the large format forum where i stepped through doing that i failed early on in my career uh, three or four years ago, I think now, I tried it again after having almost 20 years of experience under my belt and was barely able to do it because the lenses that you can get out of catalog, they're just not the right shape or glass type to put that together. Because I think the companies like Edmonds um, just spit out a bunch of lenses that can maybe be used for like... Um, for laser systems, I, I don't know. They, they put them in there. I don't know who buys them. I don't buy them because all the imaging optics that I make require a special, you know, it's just, it's the problem that you're running into where yeah. you have to have a specially, specially shaped lens to correct some of the aberrations. It's gotta make, be made out of a certain glass type. The glass type's gotta play with the other glass type. It's this whole multi-variable design environment it's very, very uh, friendly to customization and unfriendly to using stock parts. So I'm right. going to come back to a question that I asked earlier on, and I'm going to ask it in a more specific way. Um, when are we going to get the pictographic core? Um, <laughs> 
45 millimeter F2 uh, like a thread mount lens because I want. <laughs> Have you been talking to Simon? Um, no, actually, by the way, um, I just said the same thing because um, Hamish is doing a deal with making lenses. I yes. asked him that, or whatever the feed is for his company. I said, please, 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 please. I won't be able to afford it. Please make this. Um, so, so uh, yeah. When? Yeah. Okay. So when? Uh, it's, When's that coming? It's on the road. It's on the roadmap. It's just a matter of uh -huh. it. It comes down to time at this point. Yeah. I do have a, a good working relationship with an optical shop, uh -huh. which uh, here in the states, one of the best in the country that that nobody in the photography community has probably ever heard of. Um, they're hoping to change that as they grow their business. Um, yeah, well, you that, can co-brand, co-brand. Yeah, that. Uh, <laughs> that I sort of uh, broached the idea of designing optics because like I said earlier, my business partner is a mechanical engineer. When you get an optics guy and an ME together, at some point, a lens is gonna spit out. And, yeah. and right now it's um, trying to figure out exactly what uh, type of lens to design. 45 uh, 40 millimeter F2, like a thread. <laughs> That's kind of what I. That's kind of what I've heard, Graham. And <laughs> uh, the the other kind of cool thing. So, and this gets in. Uh, you you're gonna get me started again. Um, we gotta wind down. I, <laughs> I, I've talked. I've talked about. We talked about this a lot, and and haven't made it really public because I, I don't know when I'm gonna be able to work on it. Hopefully this year. But what I want to do. Um, I mean, I'm going to have an optical product line. There's, there's no doubt about it. It's going to be something that will, that, uh, that could help me make this Pictoria Graphica my day job. Um, what I'd like to do, my vision for that is um, sort of, sort of looks to the fact that we've got German lenses out there, we've got Japanese lenses, uh, Asian lenses coming from the Asian market. Where are the American designed and right. produced optics? I don't see any more anymore. I don't see any of them anymore. I think it's a shame because the optical design community, not just myself, um, I'm just a pretender, but the op American optical community is very, um, very technically capable of putting out lenses that would compete with those guys. And I would love to see an American lens with an American style to it come to market and, orange and if and i can help it i'm gonna or canadian uh well well they've got elcan and and elcan makes great optics they're they're one of the go-to's in my industry for for getting quotes uh you you pay for it um but uh in any case i would love to be able to make a good quality high performance uh american lens the the trick to it is is the cost because these things aren't aren't cheap mm -hmm. so obviously but it you know if it's if it's made for a a, a like amount then i don't want to say i can mark it up but uh may, maybe that that sort of clientele could could afford it mm -hmm. and the price range i'm going for is is uh i don't want to share numbers or anything like that because it's very mm -hmm. preliminary but um i i think i have a way to get to a reasonable price point um on a on a full frame format lens cool but we'll you know, see we'll see how that plays out and one and of the reasons, have, I, one of the reasons I, why i say a, like a thread is because that can that's easily adapted to leica m which is yes. easily adapted to every mirrorless including uh nick's gfx yeah. um so that's the reason why i say like a thread i don't i don't have I've like M. So, but anyway, another yeah, another thing I'm finding out uh, using this big sensor is that some of the very very best lenses, from my point of view, from my taste, are small, relatively small and simple rangefinder lenses. And like you know, a lot of the Voigtlander color scope bars, they're just simple small lenses. Yeah. But something about the way they 
the way they do so much with so little really comes through. Um, yeah. So that's not as many parts to make. And, you know, I think there's something to be said for keeping things fairly simple. And some triplets yeah. I've we, found are just amazing. Yeah, we do have a CAD model for a, um, for a mechanical design. And, and we were looking at one optical design, but um, I didn't like it. So we're starting all over, uh, except the me mechanical stuff. Um, part of the challenge is, and this, this is where I've got to have, keep a real good, you know, feel the pulse of the market. Part of the challenge of the like amount is that there's a expectation of quality on one side and, and build, build quality stuff, which I'm not worried about, uh, but, but image quality. But then Nick, to what, to your point, I also want to keep it simple because I could, I could easily, even with all my experience, easily fail if I made this thing too complex. So I want to keep it simple, you know, keep it simple, stupid, which, which uh, gives you a, a, a different quality or different look to the lens. So, you know, that softness that you and I like, uh, when it's wide open and it's top down and gets sharper versus what the Leica community would expect in, in resolution. So it's like, ah, where's, it's probably going to be somewhere in between. Well, also it's, there's another, there's another thing about all that, which is if you don't, if you want to, if you make it a, uh, a rangefinder lens, then you are limiting yourself to short, to mirrorless cameras and rangefinders basically. Yeah. If you build it on a longer uh, flange back distance, then you don't have to tie it down to one mount. It's very easy to put different mounts behind it. You know, right. you could just have the threaded thing and someone in China will make adapters immediately. You know? <laughs> yeah, and we've, yeah. Uh, we've, we've had those discussions and stuff and I think we have a path forward. And mm -hmm. Like I said, at least for initial, for initial offering, you know, down the road, obviously it, it wouldn't be the only lens that we ever made unless unless it ends up being total crap, which I would hope that wouldn't happen. But, uh, you know, assuming it's successful, then there will be more lenses to follow. Um, how to handle that and all that good stuff is sort of the interesting, it, it, it's, it's a lot of the same thought process that, that I go through at work, which, which is the interesting part, aside from the, doing the optical design itself, which I've been lazy about. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Like I said, it's just, I really, what I need to do is I need to be independently wealthy. So I have time to do stuff like this, but I, but that's, I'm not. So that's a goal. By the way, I know how to make you independently wealthy. The first lens you put out should be an 18 to 55 F4 to F5.6 because everybody, <laughs> Everybody needs one of those. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll shut. Oh up. yeah. Uh, I oh, think well, no, there's there's. Oh. Well, I'm going to throw one more thing at okay. you. Okay. Um, experimenting with uh, trying to adapt everything to everything. The the lenses I've also found to be incredibly useful are piece lenses designed with really big image circles because they can work on everything. So I'm using yeah. I'm using piece Nikkor PC lenses on this big big sensor because they are incredibly sharp and cover the whole thing beautifully. So there's another deal nowadays. You don't necessarily need to make, you could make lenses that can be used for many, many, many different purposes because we have such a proliferation of ways to image now. Um, so yeah. That's another thing to think about is just to make something a little bit, maybe more of a crescent wrench that can do a lot of different things. Uh, yeah. But it's so. it's yeah we hashed out a lot of a lot of different ideas of of what an initial offering would be and, and some of it some of it we go okay this would be awesome but we're going to set that aside and we'll put it on the roadmap as, as something to look at as maybe a second offering or third mm -hmm. offering what and, and really tried to boil it down to if we had if we had one chance to, to get this right, mm -hmm. what will capture the biggest chunk of interest? Right. And, and like it's a Leica M mount, I think. Um, uh, a, a focal length that's useful for street photography. 
-hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to be the fastest lens out there. Mm -hmm. It should be decent quality, uh, you know. So there's this whole discussion that right. we had. It's it's been interesting stuff, and in the I end. think I'm going to throw in one more idea, which is that something that isn't super common in itself is appealing. And I've been really taken with 30 millimeter field of view lately. <laughs> and there's hardly any lenses made. <laughs> yeah, I was and about to say, where do you get one to play with that? 30 to 32. Well, if you put it on the wrong, if you put the wrong lens on the wrong camera, you can get that. So by putting a 21 millimeter lens on an APS-C camera, <laughs> I get that field of view. And okay. it, so there's something to be thought about there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's it, it's definitely exciting to think about and, and and imagine what could come down the road, uh, what what we could do. I mean, mm -hmm. um, Jason, thank you very much for coming along uh, on this ride and taking us on this ride. I should say, um, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, um, uh, let's talk about the Pictorographica, the J Lane plates. Um, yeah. How do they get a hold of those? So, so the easiest way, there's a couple ways. Um, you can go to the website, www.pictoriographica.com. And I hope to God that you're going to throw that up on the, on the screen. Uh, I uh, because, yeah. or not, not right now, but, that, uh, or maybe add a link, uh, because it's, it's not easy to spell. That's sort of, I did that for personal entertainment reasons. Because <laughs> nobody can pronounce it the first time. There yeah, it is. There you go. Um, this, has, um, this has a lot of good info on it. The technical and tips page is all my hard earned experience of shooting dry plates. Um, a lot of the aspects to it answers most of the questions you might have. Um, there's a blog on there where I post uh characteristic curves for the emulsions for the batches uh when i remember to see i'm actually on batch number 60 um so i've been lazy um hey. then there's a there's a page that uh where to get them lists all the retailers that you can get them from um and there's a contact page that you can ask me questions and there's also an online shop um, this is where you can get uh, all the plates and accessories and stuff like that um, and some of my lame excuse for artwork um, and sometimes I'll post experimental stuff there the, the thing that I'm working on now is is dry plate amber types which is ah, they're sold out which is a, a, a special emulsion coated on black glass and if you develop it in a developer um, that a guy named Lee Lira and I are working on, um, you'll get a positive image that looks kind of like a, 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 a tintype, um, but, but without the, the wet plate chemistry. Um, that's actually an active ongoing discussion on Facebook in the dry plate photographers group. So if you are interested in dry plates and you're on social media, that's a good place to go. It's an active dry plate community. Um, and, and what's the platform? Is that Facebook? Facebook. That's Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's an about page, which I made a bunch of shit up about myself. Um, and uh, and yeah, so that's that's sort of your portal. Um, this is my pre-COVID haircut. Uh huh. <laughs> And now his post COVID got, haircut is yeah. I've got more right. of a mad scientist yeah. thing. Nick going. does too. Nick, take your hat off. Let's uh, let's compare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is my today haircut. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I've recently started shaving again because I can take my mask off now. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, in, I in the grocery to store. <laughs> do that. It's funny. I'm one of the few people who's dared to bear my face. I'm like so vaccinated now, and almost everyone's afraid now to bear <laughs> directly. Like in sort the of presence. naturally keeps uh, 
bubble around you as you move okay. through. Yeah, right. Well, exactly. I, I kind of, <laughs> it's true. People like kind of reel back in horror when they see that the mouth exposed it, but and I don't blame them. I don't blame them, but I also <laughs> feel like I need to build up my immune system a little bit, you know, because we've all been so coddled now for a year. We haven't had a germ in our nose, you know, for a long time. We need to Hence get back. Hence the almost non-existent <laughs> of the flu this year it's wiped out completely but imagine what will happen when everyone finally takes their masks off we're all going to get really sick which is the reason why yeah. i don't uh, <laughs> so okay so uh you're also on and it's uh pictorographica on at, yeah at pictorographica on instagram uh facebook and instagram i'm, I'm pretty active so if you're on social media and you want to get hold of me those are good ways to do it. Usually what I'm doing is if I'm in a boring meeting, uh -huh. I'm keeping myself occupied. And if I hear my name called, I'll unmute and go, yes, I agree. And then go back to, <laughs> and that's how I stay awake during meetings at work. I was um, once doing that um, during a graduation ceremony. And uh, the president was talking about uh, the teacher of the year and I, how you'd done a whole bunch of stuff and I was off somewhere else. Graham. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. And it was like, what? What did I do? <laughs> I had I had a meeting. This was just a couple of weeks ago. And don't I'm glad you guys don't know anybody I work with. Um <laughs> they're all I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, wasn't paying attention at all, and then I heard. Uh, Jason, can you talk to this? I had no idea what was going on, but I was like, uh, yeah. So, and then I started talking about something which I thought might be kind of related uh -huh. and then, and then was done and they were like, okay. And they moved or thanks for the insight or something like that. And I got a message from one of my coworkers that that was very insightful. I was, <laughs> had no idea what the hell was going on. I was like, ah, uh, yes. I was thank I was like, thanks. Or they were like, thank you. I'm like, oh, you're welcome. So, you know, fake it, <laughs> fake it till you make it, but yes. <laughs> or or well, fake it until you get fired. Uh, well, I think there's, there's a little bit of the Chauncey Gardner effect, I think, uh, Absolutely. when you don't know what's going on. You know? Yes, I like, <laughs> I like to sow the seeds. Um, okay, so um, anyway, okay, so Nick, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, you could try... Uh, uh, Abby Nick, A B Y N I C K on Instagram, and that's probably as good. Or way drop by his house. Um, Ethan <laughs> is out um, hiking, um, uh, but you can get a hold of Ethan, uh, Ethan at cameradactyl.com and uh, at cameradactyl on the socials. I am uh, on Instagram, Graham Homemade Camera. I'm also down the fidelity curve on Instagram. And uh, we want to thank uh, Robbie Cribs, who will, you know, who did the music. And we'll be putting music in in the near future. Um, today was a little <laughs> bit of a seat of the pants uh, kind of thing. Mm. But uh, Robbie, thank you very much. And we will, uh, we're gonna take a, a little bit of June off. Um, I'm going to the mountains and I have bad internet and um, all that type of thing. Um, and, but uh, we'll be back in July with a bunch of other stuff. We have some people lined up. Um, other than that, uh, thanks a lot, Jason. We'll see you later. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jason and Robbie. Uh, it's, it's been my pleasure. Thanks, guys, for having me on. It's been a, it's been a blast. All right, okay. I'm in. And